Finally, finally, the character I think many of us can agree on that we all really dislike has finally been eliminated. Rebreon, Rebreon A. However you pronounce her name, honestly, I don't care because I don't like her character. And I'm glad she's gone because her overall character appearance has annoyed me since the very beginning. You know, no, 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 you know what? I'll take that back, okay? At first, I was annoyed, okay? I was willing to give her a chance. But then, after the entirety of seeing her constantly on screen, having so much screen time focused on her, especially with the Goku vs. Jiren fight, I was like, okay, enough is enough, I do not like her, and having an episode fully focused on her, I'm like, she better get knocked out. Like, if she is not knocked out this week, I was legit gonna be livid. I I'm not even gonna joke, I was gonna be livid. But thankfully... Thankfully, Toei, they, they blessed us. They blessed us this week. They blessed us with Rebron getting knocked out of the ring. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, anyways. Okay, so this episode, I could see some having problems with it, which this is, you know, how it usually is when it comes to Dragon Ball Super, a new episode. There's always those out there that find a problem, which is understandable because nothing is without flaws. I can agree to that. However, the big flaw that many are probably going to complain about is definitely the power of love. Now, I want to be honest here. I'm not the biggest fan of the power of love concept, especially in Dragon Ball Super. I'm not the biggest fan of it, especially, you know, Universe 2's usage of love, okay? Their usage of love is just very strange, weird, and it just... It doesn't fit, honestly. With the vibe of what this arc is supposed to be about, the Tournament of Power and all that, it's just, it's very weird. It doesn't fit personally to me. And, I mean, I can see many out there probably enjoying it, laughing, and, you know, saying this is funny, which I could see that because comedy is subjective, and if you like it, you like it, won't fault you for it. However, I'm not the biggest fan of the Power of Love thing that was going on in these all these episodes, especially in this episode, and I'm glad to see her gone. I, I'm glad to see that basically Universe 2 is eliminated now, and they're probably going to be gone very soon. But anyways, though, the whole concept of this episode that many will be complaining about is the power of love, because Rebron, she powers up. After, you know, powering down, she has everybody out there and, you know, watching and all that in the, you know, seats. So like, hey, you know, wave this around, and then she started getting, like, the a spirit bomb type, like, energy going within her, and it made it to where she was able to transfer form become a lot bigger and have a lot more power which in turn she did get defeated thankfully but she had this power love that gave her a lot of strength and in turn you had to wear android 18 she had her power love and she was able to overcome her and defeat her in the end of the episode so the concept there i could see Minnie having a problem with it because the power love thing it just yeah it's like mm-mm I know the message, I know what the message of the episode was, which is about, you know, 18 having a stronger bond with Krillin than what Universe, two, you know, 2 has. For instance, Universe 2's perspective on love is very warped and very shallow and hypocritical. We have easily seen that. I mean, let's look at what, you know, Riberane said in this episode, okay? She said that, wait, how can you love Krillin? How can you love that? That's your husband? He doesn't have a nose. You're shameful. You don't know what love is. That's what Riberane said to 18 about her own husband, Okay. That right there just shows how shallow her love is. Shallow, you know, Rebron's love is. The Universe 2's love. Because love is subjective. And also, looks is subjective. Beauty is subjective. Just because someone looks ugly in your viewpoint doesn't mean they're ugly. That's just your thoughts or your opinion. And so when she was, like, looking at Krill, like, oh, he doesn't have a nose, he's ugly or whatever, he's not someone that, you know, is actually a perfect representation of love, I'm like, you hypocritical... I can't say anything because you know how YouTube is nowadays, but basically you you're really hypocritical right now I, I, I just couldn't stand that I'm like have you actually looked in a mirror read on have you have you pulled up a mirror to look in your face now? Like I said, I know I'm emphasizing the fact that you know beauty is subjective But I mean she's complaining at Krill and saying he has no nose I'm like have you looked at yourself? You don't even have a nose either It looks like you have two little you know Voldemort, you know nose holes going on so just read on she Oh, like her hypocritical, shallow nature when it comes to love. I'm glad she got stomped. I'm glad she got knocked out. And I know the message there was to show how shallow she was. And she found out that 18 had a different form of love than, you know, she's ever seen in her universe, which is cool. Cool and all. Like the message. I like to see, you know, confirmation to show it that how much 18 really does love Krillin and how far she will go. But that's basically it. That was the entire message of the episode. And so I could see why someone had problems with that. I, I, I can automatically see why. But despite that, regardless of that, it was a good episode. And let me explain why it's good. Number one, Rebiron's gone. 
She's gone. We're not, we're not gonna have like love, love, love. Like that's gone. F thank you, thank you. That that's gone. So we don't have to worry about that. That is over. That's a that's a major plus. That like knocks this episode up to like nine out of ten just because she has been eliminated. I'm not even joking. Okay, just that alone. But then you give me Android 17 and 18 action and you know combos and stuff going in. That's what I really like. Okay, regardless of who they were fighting, I was really enjoying the fact that Android 17 or 18 were doing some really good teamwork, working together. It reminded me of, once again, why I love these two characters and why I love the Android saga so much and why I love, you know, the History of Trunks movie. It's because seeing these two work together to take down an opponent. For instance, let's talk about the segment to when Android 17 and 18, they were, like, having to team up. Like, for instance, it looked like they were having their own opponents, but all of a sudden, 18 led over, you know, her opponent to where she wanted to be, and then 17 intervened and all that, and then they attacked each other, and it was just, you know, chaos. They both worked together. That right there, they were able to communicate without words. Number one, the reason why is, is because they're twins. They're, they're twins, they're siblings, and so they know how each other are. But also, they have fought with each other a long time, they know how each other are, and so the way they're able to communicate without even talking, I truly love that segment, just seeing that teamwork, and especially when 17 comes in and all that, when, you know, 18 is going up Rebiron's arm, and you see 17 come in, he puts up the perfect android barrier, puts it up, blocks the attack, I'm like, yo, that's epic, I just love that attack, in general, I just love it, I'm a big fan of that, I use that all the time when I play, you know, Dragon Ball games, I was just really happy to see that, but he comes in, he's like, I'm sorry, it took me a little bit longer, screen panels over to seeing this, like, metal dude just completely destroyed and on the ground, I'm like, Oh man, just eight, 18 and 17, they're just amazing, especially 17, the way he goes in and does stuff like that. But getting back on topic though, 18 and 17's teamwork right there, it just, it made me happy, because I know many might not care about it, I know many at the end of the day might not care as much as I do when it comes to 17 and 18, because I, I know there's others out there that just cannot look past the fact that, you know, Reberon was the focus of this episode, and I can see why, but even then, though, I truly appreciate seeing these two fight, and they definitely have been a big highlight of the Tournament of Power arc, because... I'm just glad to see them relevant again, fighting again, seeing them work together, seeing just this combo between each other, how they fight together. It just reminded me of the savage stuff they used to do in the movies and their, you know, Android saga. Remember how they used to fight together? You remember how, you know, the History Trunks movie was when they ganged up on Gohan? Just seeing stuff like this, I was like, I like this. I just like that style. But, uh, let's talk about, um, the scene with 18 having her leg hurt. So, 18's leg was hurt, and it was a very different moment. It was a moment that we're actually not used to seeing, especially with these two characters. Because, when you think of 17 as a character, okay, he is someone that is a stone-cold epic person. Like, th this man goes in and he just destroys people, okay? You don't think of someone like that as someone that is willing to sit down and take care of his sister. And when he sat there talking to 18 and, you know, fixed her leg, I'm like, whoa! Like, he really shows how much he cares about his sister, which we know he cares, but seeing that the representation of showing how much he cares and how Toei focused on that, it kind of showed how these two have a really good bond, how they understand each other and how they can talk about anything. I mean, stuff they normally wouldn't talk about. It added a layer of characterization in depth to them that you don't normally get to see because like I said normally when we see 17 he's always being epic and doing some crazy stuff it's like how you know Vegeta has been in you know Dragon Ball Super how we have seen so much develop with him I mean how this man is a family man now he is a really good person now. I mean, you go back to Majin Saga, like the Boo Saga and stuff, to the Cell Saga, to, you know, the Saiyan Saga before Freeze and stuff. Vegeta is a completely different character. He would never do the stuff he has been doing in Dragon Ball Super. He's developed so much, and in this way, that's how I look at 17. You can see how much he has changed, how much he's developed, and how much he really does care, and he definitely does care about his sister. So just a really nice segment. But anyway, since I was just talking about Vegeta, let's talk about that for a second. So, Vegeta... At the beginning of the episode, he is trying to tap into Ultra Instinct, which makes perfect sense, because this fits with Vegeta's character. I mean, as we know, Vegeta and Goku are the rivals. They, they've been a rival, or rivals to each other since, like, you know, the beginning of Dragon Ball Z. And Vegeta's always wanting to keep up with Goku. And since Dragon Ball Super started, it was established that Goku and Vegeta are finally kind of, like, roughly equals. And now, since Goku has Kaioken, he's finally unlocked that or used it now, and it's relevant to the plot again, and he's using it with, you know, Super Saiyan Blue. Basically, it's 
made to where Goku is a step ahead of Vegeta now. He, he is now clearly above Vegeta, and Vegeta now is kind of like nowhere near Goku. He's still the second man at this moment, which is pretty upsetting. For, you know, a Vegeta fan myself, it's upsetting, but it's understandable because Goku is the MC, and it's obvious that he will probably always be the strongest. But even then, though, Vegeta's always getting that shaft, and I wish he didn't. I, I wish he finally had the spotlight for a little bit instead of always getting shafted to second place or even third place. But getting off of that, though, okay, that's my bias coming in. Basically, Vegeta tries to unlock Ultra Instinct, which it fits with his character, because this is how he is. He, he likes to always keep up with Goku. And so he's like, if Goku can do it, if Kakarot can do it, then obviously I can do it. I, I should be able to do it. Now... Goku, as we know, he had no prior training in this. He, he had no training to be able to use Ultra Instinct, so Vegeta's basically at the same level as Goku. He, he, he If Goku can do it, he definitely can. He just needs to figure out how to achieve that form, how to achieve, you know, Ultra Instinct. And we get to see an example that kind of confirms what I was talking about in my last review of Dragon Ball Super. You remember how we found out Goku, he is a defensive-style Ultra Instinct user. For instance, when he is using Ultra Instinct, he can defend really well, but when it comes to him attacking, he can't really do it at all. He, he's not really good at it. He can't put enough power into his punches, and he starts thinking, which in turn just makes it to where he cannot properly utilize Ultra Instinct. So, when you look at it statistic-wise, he, he actually has mastered 50% of Ultra Instinct, and the other 50 he fails at, which is all offensive part of Ultra Instinct. While, as I said, Vegeta, since he's like, you know, always been that rival to Goku, it would make perfect sense if he was the offensive Ultra Instinct user, and he wasn't able to do any defensive combat at all with it. Now, that would be really cool to balance out Goku and Vegeta, and seeing in this episode that Vegeta tried to be completely defenseless and let the dude just pummel him in the face, you see how Vegeta couldn't use Ultra Instinct, but then, all of a sudden, when the dude was coming in, he grabs the man's fist and attacks him. It fits Vegeta's style. Even they said in the stands that fits Vegeta's style more. So, the more I look at it, the more I'm assuming that Toei's trying to imply that Vegeta will learn the stuff that Goku cannot learn, and then They'll both have their own stuff they're good at and they're not good at, which I think would be perfectly fine with me, honestly. As a Vegeta fan, and also loving Goku as well, seeing these two characters actually having something they're good at and then bad at, like they both have something that they each other can do and the other cannot, that makes me very happy, and I would really love if that was definitely the case. And so that would mean if these two were to fuse together into Vegito, that would mean that they would have perfect Ultra Instinct. They would have a complete mastery over it, because if Vegeta, you know, has a perfect mastery over offensive, Goku has a perfect mastery of defensive, and they were together, insta-KO to anyone they were to fight. It, it would be GG. Just straight up GG. So... I like how that segment was trying to imply that. Now, I don't know if my theory is correct or what I said last week, but it's looking more and more possible as I see scenes like that, especially at the beginning of this episode. Anyways, let's talk about the next, you know, episode preview, or next week's episode preview that, you know, appeared at the end of this episode. We get to see how majority of the episode is going to be focusing on Goku versus the leftovers of Universe 2 and also the Namekians that are going up against Gohan and Piccolo. Now, we also get to see a brief glimpse of Gohan going into, you know, potential Unleashed or, you know, Ultimate Gohan form. I'm actually looking forward to that because I think I've admitted I'm a Gohan fan. He's, he, he's one of my favorites. He is. And I'm glad to see Gohan... Finally, you know, showcasing the power he once had. He's always had the potential. He's always had the potential to be the strongest out of the entire cast. It's just because of him being a family man, it kind of held him back overall from his growth. And I'm glad to see him, you know, finally stepping up and being a big spotlight in this arc. That's why I really was interested in the tournament power was because of Gohan and also the androids as well. But um, Gohan, though, he is showcasing his ultimate, you know, form. And I'm looking forward to it. I wonder if that's enough to wipe out the Namekians because we know Ultimate Gohan's pretty OP. It's a pretty strong form. So I'm curious if those Namekians are going to be able to hold off Gohan or if Gohan's going to struggle. Now, if Gohan struggles, that's going to be interesting. That's legit going to be interesting. I I'm curious if that definitely would happen or not. Anyways, though... We also have it to where there is a brief image that looks like Piccolo is trying to sacrifice himself. And I see you, I see what you're doing there, Toei, because if you like Gohan and Piccolo and you know anything about Dragon Ball Z, then most likely you're going to remember the most iconic moment in the series. One of the most iconic moments, which is when Piccolo 
sacrificed himself for Gohan, which was at the beginning of Dragon Ball Z. And there's an image in the next episode preview where you see, it looks like Piccolo is getting hit by something like a big key blast, and he, his mouth is wide open, which looks very, very eerily similar to the way he looked when he got hit by Nappa and all that in Dragon Ball Z. So I'm very curious if that's what Toei's trying to do, showcasing that once again Piccolo's happened to do the work for Gohan, and Gohan still cannot dodge. He's still not learned how to dodge at all. So, we'll see. But that's about it when it comes to this week's episode of Dragon Ball Super. So, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? Please be honest in the comments below. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. And if you like this video, please leave a like. And if you don't like this video, well, you know, leave a dislike. Don't fault you for it. Love you guys. Please be safe. Chibi out.